Good afternoon, and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Venus Disease, the Gravitational Challenge. My name is Kelly Baer, and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the Questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. On the left sidebar, please also note the Resources tab. Click on this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the SVU CME credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. The, today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Melody Hefline. Ms. Hefline is a certified nurse practitioner at Southern Surgical Group in West Columbia, South Carolina. She is certified as a clinical nurse specialist, acute care nurse practitioner, and advanced cardiac life support provider. Ms. Hefline serves as a member of the IAC Vein Center Board of Directors, representing the Society for Vascular Nursing. She has spoken at conferences across the country and has published in numerous journals, and we are happy to have her with us today. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Melody Hefline. Melody? Thank you, Kelly. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I hope this will be an informational session for everyone. Uh, we're talking this afternoon about venous disease, the gravitational challenge. Our objectives this afternoon will be to review venous anatomy, list the physiologic factors that influence venous return, differentiate between varicose veins, superficial and deep venous thrombosis, chronic insufficiency, and all their treatments. We'll describe risk factors for chronic venous insufficiency and describe the medical and surgical treatment for CVI as well. The venous system serves as a means to return unoxygenated blood from the tissues to the heart and lungs to be reoxygenated and distributed again to the tissues via the arterial system. The venous system flow is intermittent and moves forward with each beat of the heart. The flow of blood against gravity is assisted by valves on the interior surface of the vessels in the lower extremity. The valves open and close with the heartbeat to prevent the flow of blood from moving backwards. Veins are a low pressure system, but have the ability to hold large amounts of fluid. They are very compliant and allow for large volume shifts with little pressure change. They receive their own blood supply by a network of small blood vessels that surround them called the vasa vasorum. Venules collect blood from the capillaries and lead into the veins. The deep venous system begins distally as sinusoids, progressing to paired anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and peroneal veins converging at the popliteal vein. The popliteal vein becomes a superficial femoral vein and joins with the profunda femoris to form the common femoral leading to the external and internal iliac veins. The great saphenous vein, which is the longest vein in the body and may sometimes be referred to as the long saphenous, begins anterior to the medial malleolus, traverses the foramen ovale in the upper medial thigh to join the common femoral vein at the inguinal ligament. The small saphenous vein, sometimes referred to as the lesser saphenous, passes along the lateral side of the foot and joins the popliteal vein 
behind the knee. Perforator veins are located distally at the medial malleolus, medial calf, and distal medial thigh and allow blood flow from superficial veins to deep veins and prevent blood from flowing backwards into the superficial system. From the head and neck and thorax, the internal jugular vein provides the majority of venous drainage from the brain and joins the subclavian vein to form the innominate vein. The vertebral vein drains the posterior areas of the head. The external jugular drains the superficial areas of the head and neck and empties into the subclavian. The innominate vein joins to form the superior vena cava, which empties into the right atrium. Venous blood from the thorax empties into the superior vena cava from the azygos venous system. The inferior vena cava returns blood from the lower extremity and is formed by the right and left common iliac veins. The hepatic portal system drains blood from the stomach, intestines, spleen, and pancreas. Normal venous return is a result of two mechanisms. The calf muscle pump during ambulation contracts and compresses the venous compartment. This propels blood in the veins up towards the heart. This occurs in a milking-like fashion to propel the blood back towards the heart. The one-way valves open when the calf muscle contracts and closes when the calf muscle relaxes, and this prevents the reflux of blood and distension of the veins. Approximately 90% of the venous return in the legs passes through the deep veins. A competent vein is one in which the valves function properly by opening and closing completely. An incompetent valve is defined as one in which blood flows retrograde or in the wrong direction. When blood flows backward into the vein, it is defined as reflux. Valve malfunction allows backflow in veins. Veins stay full, valves don't close, and pressure in the veins remains abnormally high and leads to venous hypertension. If perforating veins develop valve malfunction, the high pressure developed in the deep veins with muscle contractions are transmitted to the superficial veins. Primary dysfunction of the left ventricle will decrease blood flow to the extremities. Venous return is dependent on cardiac output. If there is less blood flowing into the extremities, there will be a decrease in venous return to the heart. Secondary causes of decreased venous return include dysfunction of the calf muscle pump, leading to ineffective pumping of blood out of the extremity. This may be caused by muscle wasting, neuromuscular disorder, deep fasciotomies, and local vein valve failure. In certain respiratory diseases, an increase in thoracic pressure can impede venous return from the extremities. Venous disease can include, but is not limited to, varicose veins, superficial venous thrombosis, deep venous thrombosis, chronic venous insufficiency, venous ulceration, stasis dermatitis. Venous disease can occur in the upper and lower extremities, as well in the head, neck, thoracic, and abdominal veins. For our discussion today, we will primarily be looking at the lower extremities and chronic venous insufficiency. Heredity plays a key role in the risk of developing venous disease, contributing from a structural weakness in the veins or valves or from inherited coagulopathies. Some coagulopathies may also be acquired as a result of other illnesses or events. Injury may damage veins, valves, and the calf muscle pump. Injury may be in the form of extensive trauma or as simple as an intravenous line causing irritation and local injury to the vessel. Pregnancy and obesity or hypercoagulable states, which may lead to thrombosis, but these also contribute by means of increased pressure in the veins of the lower extremities, leading to dilation and development of varicosities. Estrogen creates hormonal imbalance that may lead to increased risk of thrombosis. Conditions that predispose the patient to increased intra-abdominal pressure lead to a decrease in venous return and contribute to pooling of blood in the lower extremities increasing the risk of thrombosis. Prolonged standing produces increased pressure in the lower extremities and contributes to dilatation of vessels, 
uh, and varicosities, as well as increasing the risk of thrombosis. Crippled Fanone syndrome is a rare congenital vascular disorder in which a limb may have port wine stains, varicose veins, and or too much bone and soft tissue growth. The cause is unknown. Diets deficient in protein and adequate vitamin intake may contribute to muscle wasting and edema due to decreased colloid osmotic pressure and lead to overall poor health. Dr. R.L.K. Verkow first proposed the pathogenesis of venous thrombosis in 1856. There are three factors that contribute to the development of thrombosis. Stasis of venous blood flow in an area contributes as blood does not keep circulating and it becomes stagnant. Damage to the endothelial lining of the vein wall sets up the inflammatory process, which triggers the clotting mechanism. Changes in the coagulation mechanism of the blood increases the risk of thrombosis formation as well. The more factors present, the greater the risk of development of thrombosis. Superficial venous thrombosis, or SVT, is defined as development of thrombus in a superficial vein. This may occur in the upper or lower extremities. The most common cause of SVT is trauma, such as from intravenous catheters or intravenous infusion of irritating fluids or medications. A direct blow to the vessel may also trigger the inflammatory response leading to thrombus and or phlebitis. Hypercoagulable states, including those seen in carcinoma, may also trigger thrombus in a superficial vein. Complications include progression to DVT as the thrombus continues to extend and progressive infection that may become systemic if the infectious process is not treated. Thrombus in a superficial vein may present with inflammation in addition to a blood clot in the superficial vein. Inflammation of the vein is defined as phlebitis. It may appear as a palpable cord or a knot with raised, warm, tender areas along the vein. Erythema may also be present. Treatment begins with administration of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to decrease the inflammation and halt the thrombotic process. If the thrombus propagates to a deep vessel, full anticoagulation therapy may be needed. Depending on the situation, some patients may be treated with short-term anticoagulation rather than anti-inflammatory agents. Warm compresses, compression, and elevation aid in reduction of pain and edema. Most cases of superficial venous thrombosis respond quickly to treatment and resolve in a matter of weeks. The palpable cord may be present for several weeks or months. Deep venous thrombosis, or DVT, is defined as thrombus formation in any deep vein. This may occur in the upper or lower extremities and may extend into the veins of the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. The more extensive the DVT, the greater the risk of long-term complications. Multiple factors contribu contribute to the development of DVT, including age, heredity, surgery, any condition that leads to prolonged immobility, congenital and acquired hypercoagulable states, and hormone therapy. Once the diagnosis has been made, the goal of therapy is to prevent complications such as pulmonary embolism, postphlebitic syndrome, chronic venous insufficiency, and ulceration. Prevention of DVT begins with early recognition of risk factors and initiation of intervention designed to prevent thrombus formation. The risk of DVT rises over the age of 40, but it increases significantly over the age of 70. There is also increased risk in those with family history of DVT. Surgery increases the risk of DVT for many reasons. Longer surgical procedures increase risk due to immobility during the procedure. Orthopedic surgeries carry a very high risk of DVT. More extensive procedures that lead to a prolonged immobility postoperatively contribute to DVT formation as well as underlying disease states such as malignancy. The release of tissue thromboplastin, venous stasis, reduction in fibrolinic activity, 
and local endothelial damage all contribute to the increased risk of DVT formation in the surgery patient. Prolonged immobility leads to decreased venous return due to a lack of calf muscle pump activity, which creates pooling of blood in the lower extremities. Cancer is a hypercoagulable state, and it carries a greater risk of DVT formation even without surgery. Tumors secrete clotting factors, and there is decreased fibrinolytic activity. Exposure to chemotherapeutic agents also contributes to DVT formation. Pregnancy leads to changes in estrogen and progesterone levels and also leads to impaired venous outflow through the inferior vena cava due to the enlarged uterus. In the third trimester, there is decreased fibrinolytic activity. Estrogen replacement and oral contraceptives produce many of the same changes as pregnancy. There are many coagulation disorders that contribute to the development of DBT. Many are undiagnosed at the time of presentation. The most common disorders include protein CNS deficiencies, antithrombin-3 deficiency, factor V Leiden mutation, antiphospholipid syndrome, prothrombin 20210A mutation, the polycythemia varia, myeloproliferative disorders, obesity leads to fibrinolytic system impairment and also decreases mobility. The most common signs of DVT are unilateral swelling, redness, and pain. Swelling occurs distal to the thrombus with redness and pain at the site. Pain may extend over the course of the vein due to inflammation and triggering of the thrombolytic process. A cord may form along the vein that is palpable and tender. A positive Hohmann sign may be present. This sign is positive when pain occurs in the upper calf during forced dorsiflexion of the foot. The test, however, is insensitive and nonspecific, producing many false negatives and is not reliable for diagnosis. Some patients will present with DVT who have no signs or symptoms. This may be related to partial obstruction of the vessel or small thrombus. In some patients, collateral vessels have developed and provide enough blood flow that no edema is present. Treatment of DVT begins with diagnosis and evaluation of the extent of the thrombosis. DVT in the lower extremity that does not extend into the proximal common femoral may be treated as an outpatient and begins with anticoagulation. Initial treatment begins with the initiation of a low molecular weight heparin and warfarin or other oral anticoagulant to terminate the thrombotic process. Length of therapy depends on the extent of the thrombus, the history of the previous DVT, and other risk factors that may lead to recurrence. Serial venous duplex evaluations may be performed to determine if there's been sufficient uh, recanalization of the vessel to permit safe to con discontinuation of the anticoagulant in patients with no previous history of thrombus. Iliofemoral DVT represents the most extensive form of acute disease, and these patients experience the most severe post-thrombotic sequelae. Use of thrombolytic therapy aids in eliminating thrombus from the iliofemoral venous system, and it significantly improves short and long-term venous function, and it reduces morbidity. Upper extremity DVT is usually treated with anticoagulation therapy as an outpatient. Extensive upper extremity involving extension of thrombus into the subclavian and vena cava may be treated with thrombolysis. Other guidelines for management of DVT as an outpatient may include age older than 18, medical and hemodynamic stability, willing and able to present home and perform subcutaneous injections of low molecular weight heparin if used, Contraindications to outpatient therapy may include iliofemoral DVT, phlegmasia, which is a severe edema that compromises arterial flow, symptomatic pulmonary embolism, GI bleeding in the last 10 days, positive stool guaiac, bleeding disorder, major surgery or trauma in the last two weeks, and a risk of non-adherence to the plan of care. 
Postlipidic syndrome develops as a result of previous thrombosis in a DVT. During the normal thrombolytic process following a DVT, the valves in the veins are damaged from the inflammation which occurs during recanalization of the vessel. This process leads to valvular incompetence. The more extensive the DVT, the greater the risk of postphlebitic syndrome. Early thrombolysis in extensive DVT decreases the risk of the development of postphlebitic syndrome, and good control of edema through the use of compression helps decrease its incidence and its severity in hopes of avoiding chronic venous insufficiency. Varicose veins may develop due to hereditary weakness in the structure of the vein valves or walls or both. There are four named groups of perforator veins associated with great saphenous vein, and reflux in these areas may lead to venous insufficiency. They include the Hunterian mid-upper medial thigh area, dods above the medial knee, voids medial below the knee, and cockets veins above the ankle. The pathophysiology of venous insufficiency is most often caused by valvular, valvular failure with resultant varicose veins. Valvular failure results in reflux, elevated venous pressure, and dilatation in that segment. The most common site of reflux is at the saphenofemoral junction with resultant superficial varicosities. A second, less common cause of varicosities is valvular incompetence involving the perforator veins. This is typically a result of high pressure leak gradient toward the superficial venous system and subsequent dilatation and varicose vein formation. Edema involving the lower leg and the ankle that becomes progressively worse during the day with dependency is a classic sign of venous insufficiency. The edema usually improves at night, and the foot may or may not be involved. Patients may complain of aching, fatigue, and heaviness, especially with prolonged standing or sitting in one position with legs dependent. Skin damage occurs as a result of high vein pressures and stress on the vein wall. This leads to a red and white blood cells sticking to the vessel wall and being forced out of the blood vessels into the tissues. As the red blood cells break down, the iron is deposited in the tissues, leading to a brown discoloration. As activated white blood cells enter the tissues, they release chemicals that actually begin damaging the tissues. This may lead to self-digestion of the tissues or buildup of products within the tissues, such as fibrin. These impede the diffusion of oxygen and other nutrients. The result of one or both can be death of the tissues surrounding the veins leading to a venous ulcer. Sometimes these are called stasis ulcers or venous stasis ulcers. The typical venous ulcer occurs on the lower leg, usually near the ankle where vein pressures are highest and is surrounded by skin with a rusty brown color. Diagnosis of venous disease begins with a comprehensive history and physical family history of venous disease or thrombotic events, previous thrombosis, current hormone replacement or oral contraceptives, cancer and or current chemotherapy, recent surgery, trauma or immobility, or risk factors for DVT. Previous history of thrombosis also increases the risk of development of chronic venous insufficiency. The type of pain that patients present with is also useful in the diagnosis of venous disease. Typical pain from venous disease manifests as aching, heaviness with standing, relief with elevation. Night cramps are also common. Upon physical exam, usually the findings include unilateral edema for DDT. In some cases of chronic venous insufficiency, bilateral edema is manifested as both limbs are affected by the disease. Early edema may have a pitting quality. As the disease progresses, however, the tissue becomes hardened and edema is non-pitting. Itching is common and is related to the deposition of hemosiderin in the tissue. Varicosities may or may not be present. These should be assessed with a patient in a standing position to evaluate the extent of the vein dilatation. 
Evaluation should also include assessment of skin pigment and texture. The limb may take on a characteristic champagne bottle shape with less edema at the ankle due to scarring. Venous ultrasound or ultrasonography assesses the patency and the competence of the valves to provide the diagnosis of venous disease. In the diagnosis of DVT, thrombus prevents the vein from being compressible and there is loss of flow signal with the obstruction. It allows evaluation of the extent of thrombus in an extremity, presence of mobile thrombus, which can increase the risk of pulmonary embolism, differentiation of accrute and chronic thrombus as well. Air plethysmography can also be used to diagnose venous disease. The patient is placed in a supine position and the leg veins are emptied. The thigh cuff is inflated and rapidly deflated. Low outflow may indicate previous DVT or reflux. Photoplethysmography is an indirect measurement of venous obstruction and incompetence or calf pump dysfunction. This method detects a change in blood flow and volume using infrared light. Venogram is an invasive means of diagnosis which involves the use of IV contrast injected directly into the vein to produce a radiographic image of the vessel being examined. This may be performed in conjunction with thrombolytics, angioplasty of the vessel, or placement of stents in an area of narrowing. The SEEP system of classification for venous disease was developed to improve communication among providers regarding the accurate diagnosis of venous disease. The system is useful in directing testing in patients presenting with suspected venous disease. For patients who present for initial assessment, the clinical severity is based on observation and does not require special training. As clinical severity increases, additional testing is done to determine the etiology, evaluate the anatomy, and the pathophysiology. These steps aid in the planning of intervention and on an individual basis. The classification scale begins with no evidence of venous disease, C0. C1 indicates a patient with superficial spider veins and is a cosmetic problem. C2 level is reached when varicose veins develop. Disease progression to C3 is indicated by edema, and when skin pigment changes are noted in the gator area, C4 disease is present. Level C5 is indicated by a healed ulcer, and classification progresses to a maximum level of C6 for a patient with an open, active ulcer. The revised Venus Clinical Severity Score, or VCSS, is another classification system for venous disease and examines several categories. Pain is evaluated as occurring occasionally, daily, or daily limiting daily activities. Presence of varicose veins are examined and may be few, confined to the calf or thigh, or involving the calf and thigh. Venous edema is rated as limited to the foot and ankle, extending above the ankle but below the knee, or extending to and above the knee. Skin pigmentation as graded as limited to the perimolecular area, diffuse over the lower one-third of the calf or above the lower one-third of the calf. Inflammation is evaluated in the VCSS as limited to the perimolecular area, diffuse over the lower one-third of the calf, or above the lower one-third of the calf, and induration is graded in the same manner as inflammation. The number of active ulcers are categorized based on the number present, the duration, and the size of the ulcer from less than two centimeters to greater than six centimeters. The greatest risk of chronic venous disease is that of uncontrolled edema. Control of edema is critical to the prevention of venous ulceration, recurrent dermatitis, and cellulitis. 
Progressive uncontrolled edema leads to injury to the skin, and as the skin is stretched to its maximum capacity, this leads to breakdown of the skin and allows bacteria to enter, which leads to infectious processes and ultimately to venous ulceration. The edema of venous disease is defined as excess fluid in the interstitial space. This edema can result from the changes in venous pressure, as discussed earlier, leading to increased interstitial fluid. Venous disease can also be complicated by poor lymphatic drainage. Characteristically, the edema associated with chronic venous insufficiency may involve the lower leg and the foot, it may be pitting edema, and it may occur in one or both legs, depending on the extent of the venous disease. Differentiation of the type of ulcer being evaluated includes the examination of the type of pain, the location of the ulcer, the amount of bleeding noted, and the examination of the ulcer edges. Venous ulcers usually present with mild pain and are located at the ankle. Bleeding is in the form of a venous ooze rather than a frank bleeding. The surrounding skin may be fibrotic and have the appearance of excoriation. The ulcer edges of a venous ulcer are most commonly uneven. Hyperpigmentation occurs as a result of accumulation of hemosiderin granules within the dermis after the breakdown of red blood cells. It is noted primarily in the gator area or lower one-third of the leg. Hemosiderin deposition leads to skin color changes, producing a brown rust color from the breakdown of hemoglobin in the tissues. Lipodermatosclerosis or dermatofibrosis is common. This is characterized by moderate to severe brawny edema, black to blue hyperpigmentation of the skin, exedematous skin changes, subcutaneous fibrosis, and chronic leg pain. Dermatitis occurs as a result of hemosiderin deposition, which leads to itching skin. It causes the skin to become very fragile and it becomes very susceptible to trauma. Sorry, um, the skin scratches uh, that can come from small injury or abrasions may develop into cellulitis, and this may lead to sepsis if not treated properly. The most effective treatment for venous disease is prevention. Proper nutrition aids in the prevention of obesity and weight loss, proper elastic support, especially for those who are in jobs which require prolonged standing or limited movement, decreases the risk of venous disease progression and aids in the control of edema. Testing for coagulopathies in at-risk family members may provide knowledge of pre-existing conditions that increase the risk for DVT. Thorough assessment of risk factors will provide information regarding the extent of preventive therapy that may be needed prior to surgical procedures. Exercise contributes to the strengthening of the calf muscle pump to promote venous return. Proper skin care in patients with venous disease will help reduce complications related to dry skin. Constricting garments such as socks and garters decrease venous return and can contribute to edema. Smoking cessation decreases hypercoagulability and subsequently vein damage. Review of medications and comorbidities is vital to identify those patients at risk for immunocompromise that may have delayed wound healing, which may promote infection. Patients with diabetes or those taking steroids may have a delayed healing response and are at higher risk for infection. Congestive heart failure leads to decreased venous return and can increase the incidence of edema. The presence of edema creates increased interstitial pressure and fluid accumulation. Resistance over the tissue becomes necessary for the removal of excessive fluid. 
Compression therapy provides that necessary resistance to return fluid to circulation. Generally, your compression levels can be classified as light support, which is 8 to 15 millimeters, low compression, 15 to 20 millimeters, low to moderate compression, 20 to 30 millimeters, moderate compression, 30 to 40 millimeters, and high compression, 40 to 50 millimeters. Compression minimizes pressure differences between the capillaries and the tissue. It may also aid in improvement in microcirculation and calf muscle pump action. Compression should be placed first thing in the morning. Single layer wraps, usually ACE bandages are inexpensive, but these are difficult for patients to wrap effectively and get uniform compression. These wraps tend to quickly lose their elasticity and may slip down the leg. Layered elastic wraps are more expensive and can remain in place for seven days, but should not be provided by patients and should only be applied by healthcare provider. These provide more uniform compression, and the higher amount of compression that these garments provide are best tolerated by patients who are still ambulatory. Zinc oxide wraps, known as Unis boots, are less expensive and can remain on the limb for up to seven days as well. They also provide more uniform compression. Elastic stockings are more comfortable and can be measured to ensure proper fit. Some patients may find them difficult to put on and may benefit by special adaptive devices that make application easier. Some elastic stockings are made with zippers to ease application. Stockings should be replaced about every six months. Monitor skin to assess for skin damage that may occur with pulling stockings on and off. For severe edema, intermittent pneumatic devices may be required until the limb is small enough to place in an elastic stocking. Some patients may require mechanical compression long-term. Circade wraps may be easier for some patients to apply as they wrap around the leg and can be used for very edematous legs. There are patients in whom compression should not be used. Patients with severe peripheral arterial disease with an ABI of less than 0.4 should not be placed in compression as the risk of arterial compression is significant. If the ABI is less than 0.5, caution and close observation should be maintained to prevent arterial compression. Patients with decompensated heart failure are at high risk with compression due to the inability of the heart to pump adequately as well as the risk of increasing venous return with compression and causing further failure. Patients with sepsis or at risk for multi-system failure should not be placed in compression, and compression will not allow for frequent assessment of the limb. Phlegmasia cerulea dolens occurs when there is complete obstruction of venous flow out of an extremity and this leads to arterial compression due to severe edema. It develops as a result of severe iliofemoral thrombosis with marked obstruction of venous outflows of the venous outflow system. Adding further compression to an extremity can further compromise blood flow and is contraindicated. In the presence of decreased or absent sensation in the limb, extreme caution should be taken as the patient will not be able to detect changes that may occur as a result of compression that is too tight. Some patients may have an allergic reaction to the compression material, including the zinc layer or the foam layer of the bandage. Infection present in a limb should be treated promptly, and this may warrant further assessment prior to applying comp compression bandages due to the inability to assess for the progression of infection. Elevation is vital to the control of edema caused by venous disease. It promotes venous return, and it must be performed 30 minutes at least three to four times a day. It must be elevated above the level of the heart to be successful. Even this may not be sufficient in advanced disease, thus the gravitational challenge. Long-term elevation may be required until sufficient recanalization has occurred after DVT. In many cases, evaluation, I'm sorry, elevation must become a routine method of managing edema long-term um, and become a way of life for these patients. 
Indications for surgical intervention are severe pain, varicose veins that become severe with episodes of bleeding, recurrent ulceration, and reflux in the greater or small saphenous veins. Vein ligation may occur at the saphenofemoral junction or the saphenous vein. This is performed to limit pressure on the distal saphenous vein to decrease the risk of further incompetence and distal varices. The vein may also be stripped from the groin to the knee or to the ankle if the distal portion of the vein is involved. Individual varicose veins may be treated with stab avulsion in which the individual varicose veins are removed through tiny incisions at the point of valvular reflux. Ambulatory phlebectomy is performed with tumescent anesthesia, which is produced by diluting lidocaine. This is performed with a phlebectomy hook and large varicosities are removed through very small incisions that do not require suturing. Perforator vein ligation is performed to interrupt incompetent perforator veins, and these may be performed with an open technique or in an endovascular fashion. This may enhance wound healing as well as result in a decreased venous pressure over the gator area. Sclerotherapy may be used to treat tanlangectasias and reticular veins. These are performed by injecting a sclerosing agent directly in the vein. This causes the vessel to swell and seal itself off. Blood is no longer able to enter the vessel. Common agents used may include polydocanol, sodium tetradecol sulfate, and hypertonic saline. These procedures may be done uh, using ultrasound guidance. Radiofrequency closure or ablation of varicose veins utilizes an endovenous electrode that causes controlled heating of the vessel. This produces a collapse of the vessel from heat-induced vasospasm and collagen shrinkage as the electrode is slowly withdrawn from the vessel. This procedure may also be performed with a laser. The laser procedure is bloodless and of a shorter duration than the radiofrequency ablation. It leads to thrombotic occlusion from heating of the blood component and thermal damage to the endothelium. Contraindications to sclerotherapy would include acute thrombosis or phlebitis and pregnancy. Most patients are placed in a compression following in a compression bandage following these procedures. The extremity is to be positioned to avoid severe joint flexion and assessment of dressings for signs of bleeding. Assess circulation to ensure adequate blood flow. Bandages are not too tight. Elevate the extremity to help control edema. Early ambulation reduces the risk of thromboembolic events. Complications include wound infection at surgical sites, development of DVT, hematoma formations at incisions, skin burns from laser procedures, vessel perforation, and paresthesias from nerve injury at the site of incision or puncture. Long-term goals for venous disease include um, control of edema. It hinges on appropriate medical care for the original venous problem. This is vital to prevent the long-term consequences of chronic venous insufficiency and the financial and the social implications that accompany the condition. Patient education should be centered around edema control through elevation and compression. Prevention of ulceration is promoted through thorough care of fragile dry skin. This is of the utmost importance. Patients are prone to frequent breakdown as a result of skin texture changes and especially after previous ulceration. Preventing recurrence depends on thorough patient education and patient understanding of the long-term consequences of non-adherence to the plan of care. In conclusion, I've provided you with a list of resources um, that you can consult to get further information. I would point out that the resources that were used from up to date are especially good. They go into further detail in regard to some of the procedures for treatment of venous insufficiency and other venous disorders. And I want to thank you for your time and attention today. And um, I think we will open the floor now for questions. Okay, thank you, Melody. And at this time, we'll begin the Q&A session.
Um, and again, we, we encourage you to send us your questions using the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. From IAC, I'd like to introduce Laura Humphreys, Director of Accreditation for Vane Center, and she will be assisting us with the Q&A session today. Laura, would you like to start us off? Sure, thanks Kelly and thanks Melody for that very thorough presentation on venous disease. Um, we do have some questions here. Um, we have a question, um, they're asking if, there, if you know if there's any documented correlation between venous insufficiency and restless leg syndrome. I do not know of a correlation. I will tell you that a lot of my venous disease patients uh, seem to exhibit symptoms of restless legs, but I do not know of a scientific study that links the two. Okay. Um, we have a question here. When, when performing a venous insufficiency exam on the upper extremities, would that result in a false positive due to the decrease in number of valves seen in the arms? Have you ever seen that? I've never seen that, but based physiologically on the um, fact that there are fewer valves, um, we don't see a lot of venous insufficiency in the upper extremity, um, even with extensive venous thrombosis um, in 24 years of venous practice. I don't recall ever seeing, seeing anyone that I would say had venous insufficiency of the upper extremity. More often than not, we see problems with lymphedema in the upper extremity having to do with procedures that have involved the lymph nodes in the arms, mastectomy is the, the classic example of that. Um, but I, I don't know of a case where I've actually ever seen what I would describe as chronic venous insufficiency in an arm. Okay, great. Um, I'm not sure if you remember, but there's a question about your slide number 15. You showed an infection, a progressive infection, and there's a question to see if that um, infection meant that the patient had cellulitis. Do you Usually, I don't recall that particular slide, but I will, I will say that um, cellulitis, um, many of these patients will present with cellulitis because their skin damages are, uh, their skin is so fragile. And because their skin is so fragile, the least little bit of scratch, because they itch, they do scratch a lot. And so, any breakdown of the skin, as you well know, our skin is our biggest barrier to infection. And when the skin is broken down, then bacteria can get in. And unfortunately, we live in a day and time when there are so many bacteria in our area, um, in our environment rather, uh, that the least little thing can get in. And usually that begins with cellulitis. More often than not, my patients will present with uh, an entire area of the skin that is infected. Um, it may have started with an ulcer infection, but that spreading of the infection to the skin uh, is what we deem as cellulitis. And, and sometimes people won't have an ulcer. They will have something that I can't even see that I would classify as an open wound, um, but this horrible erythema um, that is weeping and it's painful um, infection tends to increase pain dramatically. A lot of times that's the symptom that uh, lets me in on the fact that the, the patient is, ha is starting with an infection is that their pain goes up. I'll be following someone and their pain increases, their weeping increases, not necessarily with an ulcer, um, but that's what we deem as cellulitis and we treat that just as we would an infected ulcer. The challenge with cellulitis many times is if you don't have weeping and you just have this erythema and pain, you treat empirically because you, you can't, you don't have anything to culture. So you don't know exactly how, which antibiotic to treat. You just treat what uh, is maybe common to your area. Uh, empiric therapy is what we call that the best way to treat those infections are if you have any drainage, you can culture it and you can tailor that treatment to that particular um, microbe. Perfect. Um, we have a couple of questions about the SEEP and the VCSS. Um, one, mm -hmm. uh, one of the attendees is asking how often and at which visits should the SEEP and the VCSS score be documented? Um, most definitely, you're going to be documenting that at your initial visit. Um, if somebody reaches category C, 
five, obviously they are never going to go back because once you've had an ulcer, when that ulcer is healed, you will always be a C5. Um, I, I would say that depends partly on how often you're seeing the patient. Um, if you're seeing the patient frequently for an active ulcer, then they're going to be a C6 until that ulcer heals. Um, and then they would go to C5. Um, if, you're C, if these are patients that have lower level disease, um, then um, you would certainly uh, want to assess them at each visit probably for lower level disease, disease to make sure they haven't progressed. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to remember for your, your clinical severity score and your SEEP score is in the beginning when you're trying to get procedures approved, these category scores are very critical to getting um, third-party payers um, to cover these procedures. So those scores are going to be critical at that time um, because you're going to need them to justify that procedure um, to get it medically covered for your patient. Great. Um, we have a couple of questions about infection control. Um, there's a question about how you would sterilize or protect, protect transducers when you do the ultrasound scans um, from infectious wounds. Um, we would put ours in the, the sterile cover, the sterile wrap, um, the, the little plastic covers that go over those. That's how we would do ours. If you're doing an ultrasound on anybody that has any kind of infection, you would cover that probe with the um, if you're if it's a sterile procedure, obviously you're going to be under sterile conditions. Um, otherwise, it would just be a protective probe uh, so that you aren't getting microbes on your probe. Right, and obviously you would use sterile gel, correct? I would use sterile gel, absolutely, um, because you you don't want to introduce anything else into that patient that already has an infection. Most definitely. Okay, um, I have a question about. Male lower leg hair loss. Have you ever seen that as a sign of venous disease? We see that more with arterial disease, but I will tell you that <clears throat> I would, the majority of my venous patients do have some degree of hair loss. Is that because they also have some underlying arterial disease? I wouldn't have the statistics to address that particularly, but um, it certainly is. It certainly is possible. Uh, I think probably uh, when I think just varicose veins, I don't tend to see hair loss in, in just your varicosities. But as disease progresses and as that skin changes, uh, hair follicles will die because of the dermatofibrosis and the fib fibrous nature of what happens in the lower leg. Um, so there's definitely definitely less hair on the leg. I, I don't, I wouldn't, uh, did you say, did you ask me if it was just primarily in males? Yes. I, I would say not necessarily. Um, I, I see it in females as well because the hair follicles die when that, uh, the picture that I, I'm recalling to mind is the one where I showed you the dermatitis and, and um, those people don't have a lot of hair follicles. So I would say that's across the board that you get loss of hair, even in venous disease. Okay. Um, I have a little bit of a long one here. Um, it says, I have come across a patient that presented distended right jugular vein and a normal size left jugular. Her Doppler exam showed normal flow. What could be the reason for this? Or what other methods would you use to investigate? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is, is that it, it's just an anomaly and that's an anatomic difference in that individual with one vein being larger um, on the other side, um, on the contralateral side. Uh, if there's no thrombus and there's no other issue, then I don't know that I would do any further intervention. I would certainly monitor that. That might be a patient that you would want to do serial venous duplex on to to assess, um, we do occasionally see enlargement in, in veins, uh, similar to what we might see in an artery um, with enlargement of that vessel. But um, I don't know that I would do anything unless there's thrombus formation in that vessel. Okay. 
Um, I have a question that says, what are your thoughts of thermal ablations for ankle swelling? <laughs> I'm assuming this is in the absence of any documented reflux. I would think. Um, I, I, I wouldn't have any information on it, but if you don't, if there's no documented reflux in that vessel, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see how number one, you would get the study, you would get it approved if you don't have documentation of reflux. And I'm not sure what the benefit would be um, for ankle swelling in the absence of reflux in a vein. Okay. Um, we have a question about iliac extenting. Does it typically improve the venous drainage? It does. Um, iliac vein stenting, you see that most commonly in the presence of May Thurner syndrome, where you have compression of the iliac vein and um, placement of a stent there most definitely helps venous drainage. Um, I had a recent case where we had a, a young woman who had a large uterine leomyoma um, that actually compressed her iliac vein. She presented with extensive DVT with severe, um, we're talking grade four um, edema in the left lower extremity. And um, that leomyoma, her uterus was so large that it compressed the iliac vein. We did thrombolytics, got the bulk of the iliofemoral DVT out. She still had a lot of thrombus below that level. But uh, over, the la over the course of the last two or three months, she has had significant improvement after placement of the stent and is in the process of recanalizing that lower extremity. She'll need compression for a long period of time, but absolutely stenting does help. Um, it allows for recanalization and relieves that compression so that once you debulk the thrombus from the iliofemoral area, uh, you have good, good chances of, of getting recanalization and hopefully preventing long-term post-libidic syndrome with development of chronic venous insufficiency and ulceration down the road. Okay, thanks. Um, have you ever seen localized lymphedema um, caused by liposuction? I have not ever seen localized lymphedema. Um, um, I, I'm certain, you know, that could be a possibility, certainly because when you think about liposuction and, and what it does to the underlying tissues, thinking anatomically and physiologically what's happening uh, you could certainly disrupt lymph flow um, from liposuction procedures. So I would say it's feasible. Um, I just have never personally seen it. Okay. Um, somebody's asking for you to expand a little bit more on how the PPG and the air plethysmography is used to evaluate the venous system. Well, that would be certainly out of my wheelhouse because I am not a vascular sonographer. <laughs> so, Laura, I'm going to kick that question back to you. Well, I'll tell you what. We certainly don't see it very often. And I don't know how many. I, we haven't seen any facilities use it in a long time. I mean, but it's basically just a photo sensor that you would, you know, apply to the, to the patient's leg that would evaluate the waveforms. Um, usually you would apply a tourniquet. You would do some compressions. And it would kind of it would determine, you know, where the venous insufficiency was coming from. Um, but I, I would probably say that I, I can't imagine very many people use that anymore. Um, we do is, not use it in our lab. Yeah, yeah, I've, we don't see it very much. Um, and I don't think we, they ever come here to the IEC or we see them. Um, but then there is a second part of this question, which I think that you might be able to answer. Have you ever seen anybody use exercise studies to evaluate venous disease? I have never personally done that, but it, it makes such good sense to me when you think about how important the, the calf muscle pump is in regard to uh, venous return. Uh, it makes perfect sense that there would be uh, an exercise study to do that. I have never seen it used in the diagnosis of venous disease, um, but we, we know most definitely how important that calf muscle pump is, and, and that's exercise. Um, okay. Um, we're... We're kind of down to a minute now, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, it says, with patients who have open ulcers that are undergoing a venous procedure, do you recommend anything like hurricane spray be applied prior to DuraPrep chloroprep application to help numb the leg? We do our own wound care, and actually we do, um, we actually apply lidocaine gel 
and let that gel sit for a bit uh, before we actually do our uh, wound abridgments and procedures in the office. And we've had good success with using the lidocaine gel. And if I have breakthrough during procedures using the lidocaine gel, then I will use the spray to help um, get a good debridement in between um, wound care visits. Okay. Um, that was great. Thanks again, everyone. And a very special thank you to Melody Hefline for this presentation today. A lot of great questions. And please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Venus Disease, the Gravitational Challenge. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE Transcripts section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.